started. Uh, I'm going to pass uh, handouts around. I'll keep a few up front in case we have some people that come in late and have to sit up front. <laughs> so, uh, should have plenty of these. And before we get started, Karen has an announcement or a request or something. Um, we have sign-up sheet for communion service, and it seems like each month I'm trolling for people to sign up. We need four more servers for next Sunday, so if you could find it in your hearts, would you please sign up today? Thank you. Okay, and John wanted to say something too. Oh, yes. Uh, totally unreligious thing. But this morning in the newspaper, be sure to read David Brooks' column. It's a gem. So don't forget to remember. <laughs> so yes, David Brooks' column this morning. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but looking forward to it. Okay, in the handout, uh, there are scriptures that we'll be looking at today. There's a quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer that we'll, I'll comment on later. There's a version of the Lord's Prayer which comes from Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount. We'll say that together at the end. And there's a little cartoon there, and I'll comment on that a little bit later. Uh, on the back side, again, is the structure of the Sermon on the Mount. And I've ha ha passed that out several times. It's been on several of the handouts because it's so critically important to see how the sermon is structured. And as we learned on the very first lesson, uh, in the way that uh, Hebrew Jewish teaching and early Christian teaching was, they didn't put the important point at the beginning or the end, they put the important thing in the middle. And so the Sermon on the Mount is structured so that everything leads to the Lord's Prayer and the issue of forgiveness and then everything flows from the Lord's Prayer. And we need to keep that always in mind as we think about the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, just a very quick review of some of what we talked about last week. We talked about praying in secret. And if you look on the structure of the Sermon on the Mount, you see right in the middle, there's a section called Christian Praxis, the disciplines and praxis of being uh, faithful Christians. And there's three parts to it, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting. Of course, prayer is the most important. And that's what we talked about last week, uh, and especially about what Jesus says when he says, but whatever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Prayer in the secret room, which we learned last week, is, was the supply closet. It was the one room in a house of that time that could be locked from both sides. Um, and to be by yourself in prayer is critically important to enter into the experience and presence of God. And the wonderful thing is when it says uh, your Heavenly Father will reward you, the reward is God's there. God's there with you, listening to you, communicating to you through the Holy Spirit. And you don't have to do anything to get God to be there. God is already there. You just need to be there, present to the Lord, and the Lord will be there as well. So the importance of private prayer, ourselves in the spirit, in the presence of God. That doesn't mean we shouldn't pray publicly. And of course, Jesus teaches us to pray publicly. The primary example is the Lord's Prayer himself. It begins, Our Father. It's meant to be prayed uh, together and in, uh, with others. And so corporate prayer, the body of Christ gathered together, that's always important, but also private prayer is necessary for us to truly experience the fullness of God. So we talked a little bit about that last week. We also talked about righteousness last week. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And it's important to understand that he doesn't say, blessed are the righteous. It's blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It isn't something we attain. It's something that we keep pursuing. 
And then in verse 20, he says, for unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. If we think of righteousness as something we can accumulate, like cash in our wallet or a better bank account, that's the wrong way of thinking it. It's not quantitative. The pursuit of righteousness is something that's qualitative, and we need to hunger and thirst, which means trusting God. That's what the hunger and thirst for righteousness is about. It's trusting God. And so to exceed in righteousness is not a possession that we gain. It's a path. It's a way. It's a discipline for our lives. And then also last week we talked about anxiety and our Father's care for us. Jesus said, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And he goes on like that. Look at the lilies of the field. Consider how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, but Solomon in all his glory wasn't as pretty as those lilies of the field. He also said, therefore, do not worry, saying what we will eat or what we will drink or what will we wear. Your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things, but strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. And I asked the question last week, can we really live this way? And this passage, of all the passages in the Sermon on the Mount, this troubles people as much as, as any one of them. Can we really live this way? And I, I think I shared this with you last week. One commentator put it this way. Sure, birds and lilies don't worry about life, but they also don't have mortgages, car payments, grocery bills, and college tuitions to keep them awake at night. All of us would like to be relieved of worry and anxiety, but Jesus appears to be suggesting an unrealistic strategy. Look at the birds, look at the lilies, to which one is tempted to reply, yes, but look at the bills. So the sermon is teaching us to trust and not worry, but we all face challenges in life, and so it's difficult for us to really to trust in the way the, the Sermon on the Mount seems to be urging us to do. Now one way to trust God, and I think I mentioned this last week, is to affirm what the scriptures affirm in many, many places, like, for example, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea. There are great hymns that we can celebrate, a mighty fortress is our God. We can trust in these great statements of faith and assurance, but those weren't written right in the midst of the mountains shaking in the heart of the sea. Those things weren't written right in the midst of toil and trouble and difficulty. So the thing is, <clears throat> Psalm 46 is nice, other affirmations are nice, but are they enough? And I shared with you a story that one of my professors you know, my senior year at Fuller shared with us about the man on the Los Angeles freeway. And I think you'll remember that, those of you who were here. Uh, he had an hour and a half commute each way from work. Every night when he got home from that horrible commute on the LA freeways, he thanked God for safety while he drove home. Then one time, he was in a accident, he was hurt, not major hurt, but he had to spend a day in the hospital, and, and he prayed, thanking God that he was protected, and the injury uh, was as small as it was. And then some period of time later, he was in an accident on the way home, and he was killed. And his family and his friends and his church gathered together a few days later to celebrate his life and to thank God for the presence of God in this man's life and the witness he had throughout uh, his life. And the point of that is, and the professor asked us, where's God? And we tried to, as seniors, we should have known exactly how to answer the professor's question, but the answer really is, God is 
there every day when the drive home went well, when the drive home didn't go quite so well, and when even the drive home became fatal. Life isn't safe like a Disneyland ride is safe. You can have those thrilling rides at Disneyland or other parks, and unless something has gone terribly wrong, they're safe. Life isn't like that. And so we need to learn to, in all times, trust that God is present with us. And it's not easy. That's what we're all in our walk of Christian faith seeking to do, to learn uh, to trust God. That's a quick review of what we talked about last week. Any reactions, comments, thoughts? Okay, we're going to plow ahead now, and we're going to look at three sections in the last chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7. And we're going to focus on them one at a time. So we begin with the narrow gate or the wide road. And the text is on your handout. Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there will be many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, most of the interpretations of this text and the commentaries that I've read and some other things say that it's mostly about the issue of where we're going to end up in life after we die. One path being leading to life, that is eternal life. The other path leading to destruction, which is eternal damnation. <coughs> This is so much the typical interpretation of this that Tertullian, who was a great theologian in the second and third uh, century, he wrote this. The way of evil is broad and well supplied with travelers. Would not all people take its easy course if there were nothing to fear? And of course that emphasizes this thing. If we fear that we're going to end up in destruction, that is eternal damnation, then that gets our attention and we maybe will then seek for uh, the narrow way. But the narrow way is hard. And we're gonna see a little bit more about that in a moment. So the metaphor of the gate is a common metaphor. There are many interpretations about what the gate uh, is. Uh, many of you probably read, uh, at least some years back, uh, John Bunyan's uh, uh, Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Progress. Progress, right, a little senior moment there. <laughs> <laughs> um, the gate was the beginning of his journey, of Pilgrim's Progress. It was the gate that he went through, and then he had his adventures of faith as he went towards heaven along the way. That's one interpretation, but clearly the most important thing to realize is the gate is about Jesus. In fact, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. We're going to come back to the John passage in just a few moments. So in the context of the sermon, the gate, and therefore the narrow road, means following Jesus, paying attention to Jesus, and going Jesus' way. And let us not fool ourselves. This is not simple. Being a faithful Christian disciple is not for sissies. It's a demanding challenge. It's a road that we're all on. Every one of us here is on that road, but it's not an easy road. <coughs> one person said that the many who go the wide, easy way and the few who take the narrow, rough way emphasize that the way of the majority in morals is not often the way of discipleship. To be a Christian disciple is to be a moral minority. Everybody does it. Will not be very helpful as a criterion in Christian ethics. So remember what we learned about being disciples, that a disciple of Christ, a follower of Christ, is to be salty and luminous. Jesus says you are the salt of the earth, you're the light of the world. We need to be salty and luminous. But if we go the wide, easy way, that's when our saltiness disappears and when we hide the light that is in us under a big basket. 
So perhaps no one has described the difficulties more powerfully than Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I put the quote from Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship in <coughs> the handout. And I'm going to read the quote, and you can follow along the quote as I read, but <coughs> as we go through it, I'm going to break off into emphasizing the part from the Sermon on the Mount that that particular section is referring to. <coughs> so, to confess and testify to the truth that it, as it is in Jesus, and at the same time to love the enemies of that truth, his enemies and ours, and to love them with the infinite love of Jesus Christ, I'm going to break away from Matthew 5, verse 11, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then back to Bonhoeffer. Is indeed a narrow way to believe the promise of Jesus that his followers shall possess the earth. Matthew 5, 5 says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. But the world, and even maybe a lot of Christians, don't think of meekness as something that's going to lead us to inheriting the earth. Back to Bonhoeffer. And at the same time, to face our enemies unarmed and defenseless, Matthew 5, 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. Back to Bonhoeffer. Perfect preferring to incur injustice rather than do wrong ourselves. Matthew 5, verse 39 says, But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And we miss often the significance of the right cheek. Most people are right-handed. So, if I'm standing here and someone is there who's right-handed and is going to strike my right cheek, his right hand's over here, my right cheek's over here, he's going to have to hit me backwards. It's not just hitting, it's an insult. It's a backhanded insult. And then, to turn the left cheek, come back with the blow the other way. So it is both physical but also emotional and spiritual. It's an insult. It's a kind of hitting on the right cheek. <clears throat> That's what Jesus calls us to do. Let that happen to us. Uh, is indeed a narrow way to see the weakness and wrong in others and at the same time refrain from judging them. Matthew 7, verses 1 and 2. Do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged, and the measure you give will be the measure you get. The way is unutterably hard, and at every moment we are in danger of straying from it. So Dietrich Bonhoeffer, martyred as he resisted Nazism and was involved in the plot, unsuccessful plot, to kill Hitler. The road we're on is hard, friends. That's why we need each other. That's why we need the church. That's why we need to not try to do this by ourselves. We need to be strengthened by the faith and courage and witness of other people as well. We also need to be cautious about the many and the few, especially if we think we can identify the many who are going the wrong way and the few who are going the right way. This is where Christians, I think, can get in a lot of trouble. We don't know. And also remember, we started off this way, that the scriptures themselves and other ancient writings, especially uh, the Mishnah and other Jewish writings, tend to use this either-or kind of thing as a way of exaggerating uh, effect. Remember I talked about the hortatory mood, where it's on the one hand, on the other hand, for example, in the Mishnah it says, if a man performs a single commandment, it shall be well with him, and he'll have length of days, and shall inherit the land. But if he neglects a single commandment, 
He, it shall be ill with him, and he shall not have length of days, and shall not inherit the land. Keep the law, all is well. Break one law, all is not well. That's not to be taken literally. The hortatory mood is to get our attention and focus us on what we need to do. And the point is not so much to identify who's on the wide way and who's on the narrow way, but to focus on ourselves. What way am I pursuing? What direction am I going? Am I attuning myself to follow uh, Jesus? The Sermon on the Mount says the right way is to follow Jesus. Okay, we're going to go on to uh, building on the rock or on the sand in a minute. But let me stop there and see if there are any questions or reactions to this. Unutterably, I love Bonhoeffer's words. Unutterably hard. And at the, every moment, we are in danger of straying from it. That's not really to discourage us. It's meant to challenge us, to uh, gird our loins, and on we go. Yeah. So, you know, back to the narrow gate, because I kind of think about the narrow gate as on the other side of the gate is the unconditional love of God. And to pass through the gate is to be able to surrender enough of all the stuff I carry with me that <laughs> is on the wide road um, so that I can <coughs> rest in God or abide in God's love in a way that allows me to continue on a little bit narrow path. Not narrow constrictive, but um, more loving path or whatever. Okay. Um, so it, to me it's almost more like not something out there or in heaven, it's really right here. And how um, how am I able to release some of the things that I just carry with me in my daily walk to be able to hear God's voice or the Holy Spirit? Or something? I think that's a, uh, a good way of looking at it. It's kind of, we're all carrying a lot of stuff, maybe too much baggage, and uh, to get through the narrow gate, to where we have a better sense of the presence of God and our devotion to God, we have to get rid of some of that some of that baggage. I think that that's an interesting uh, way of looking at it. <coughs> Any other thoughts, reactions? Yeah. Haven't a lot of people use the narrow gate as Jesus is the only way? <coughs> How do you respond to that? There's yes, they have used it that way, um, and. I just said, the Sermon on the Mount says the right way is the way of Jesus. And as a Christian, I affirm that. And as Christians, we affirm that. We also have the interesting challenge of living in a time where the boundaries between faiths has become difficult because the boundaries are breaking down. And there's still the Christian is the absolute right way, and everyone else is going to hell. They're on the wide, easy road. Uh, it's interesting. If you are a devoted Muslim, you're following a path that is much more difficult than a lot of Christians follow in terms of the actual disciplines of, of doing things. I remember so often we see it frequently now, but uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you didn't see a lot of Muslims in airports, at least I did. But you, every once in a while, you would see one who, it was the hour of prayer for that particular person, and he went to a place off from everybody else to pray. Most Christians don't do that. We might sit in our seat and pray, but we don't make a... Anyway, the point is, yes. So I have no trouble affirming uh, that Jesus Christ is, is the way. I also keep trying to reflect that I, I don't want to put narrowness around Christ. Christ can define it himself. And I, I, I trust that the goodness of God, the grace of God, is bigger than my narrow, or even the narrow Christian view that I have. I think God's grace is, is extremely large. OK, anything else? All right, well, let's, let's move on. Building on rock or sand? 
This is on your handout. <coughs> Matthew 7, starting at verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And it's interesting, I talked about how Hebrew writing will often put the most important point in the middle, but in the Greek language, a sentence will almost always, will often have, I should say, the most important word in the sentence as the last word in the sentence. And so it's true in verse 27, which is the very last verse of the sermon, the word great, megale is the Greek word, it's the last word. And so it really would be a better translate, translation of that last phrase, its fall was great. Now elsewhere in the Sermon on the Mount, great is good, but here great is the most awful thing that can happen. It's complete, it's utter, it's total. And the difference is not the storm, the same winds, the same floods, the same rain come, to either house, the difference is totally uh, the foundation that it's built upon. And the key is hearing Jesus' words and acting on them. It's not just hearing, it's acting. Building on the rock is the one who hears these words of mine and acts on them. Building on the sand is the one who hears these words of mine and does not act on them. So it's hearing, and then it's acting. It's relatively easy to hear. It's the acting that gets to be difficult. So I want to go back um, to reflect on this idea of the gate that Jesus is and the hearing, and the way John puts it. And I didn't put these on your handout, but let me read from John chapter 10. Jesus is speaking and he says, Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all of his own out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And I was, as I was pondering uh, this lesson, I, I happened across an interesting contemporary story of sheep following a voice, following a sound that they recognize. And as far as I can tell, this is a true story. It's a Palest about a Palestinian woman. Her husband was uh, killed in recent conflict of, between the Palestinians and the Israelis. And without a husband, she was in dire need, financial need, because everything was gone. And she was finally permitted to, by a very hesitant Israeli officer, she asked if she could call her sheep out of the huge mass of sheep that, from this battle that had been put in a big, big tent. And she asked the officer if she could call her sheep out of this huge mass. And he kind of laughed, laughed at that. And he pointed to the hundreds of sheep there. And he says, uh, it's not possible for you to get your sheep out of these hundreds. <clears throat> well, she asked him if she and her son could get them to come out. <laughs> Would he let her and her son take them with them? And the soldier said, yeah, OK, he agreed. And he opened the gate. Well, her son took a little flute out of his pocket, and he began to play a simple tune again and again. And soon, sheep heads started popping up all around. And a few minutes later, as he kept playing, the 25 sheep heads that had popped up started to gather and come. 
and gathered behind the woman and her son, and off they went. The story didn't tell me the surprise or chagrin that the Israeli soldiers had about that. But it's true that sheep are attuned to a particular voice or a particular sound. And so when we are listening to Jesus, we need to attune our hearts and minds and spirits to the voice of Jesus, which we find in the scriptures and we find in our spiritual lives. Listening to the right voice is critically important. But it's not enough just to listen. It's not enough just to hear. We have to do. We have to act. And I don't know about Roger, but I, I loved studying Greek when I was in seminary. And for the early years of ministry, I could take up my Greek Testament and muddle along with it pretty well. But after 30 and 40 years doing this, ah, it's a lot of work to read the Greek, passage, Greek passages. But there's a critically important word in chapter 7. The Greek word is poietro. It means literally to do. And it's used nine times in chapter 7. Five of those times it's translated as bear in verses 17 through 19, for example. Here's an example. In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. That's a form of, of the word to do. Two times it means literally does or do. For example, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And then twice it's used to translate, the poiato is translated as act or acts. Those who build a life on a rock foundation are those who hear words and act on them or do not act on them. And so the sermon is calling us to hear, but we can't stop with hearing. We've got to act on it. And that's emphasized throughout all of chapter 7. And this is where teacher and student or preacher and parishioner needs to be very careful. Because calls to action are pretty simple. It's discourse. It's words. It's just talking. But the goal isn't the talking. The goal is living a proper life in the world. Martin Luther wrote, the doctrine is good and a precious thing, but it is not being preached for the sake of being heard, but for the sake of action and its application to life. Friends, this really is the burden of those of us who have been called into teaching and preaching. I mean, every time that we preach or teach, we're, we're trying to help you. We're trying to push you, we're trying to motivate you, we're trying to challenge you, we're trying to prod you to change. And of course, we joke about it, but the truth is, we preachers are very weak vessels. And we also need to do more than talk. We need to also live the words that we preach. And that's, so that's why I put the little cartoon in your head. <coughs> you look at that, says, I've stopped expecting you to make leaps of faith, but it would be nice to see a hawk now and then. <laughs> well, that can be kind of a humorous dig at parishioners, but it can also be a less humorous dig at we preachers who've gotten old and tired and no longer preach leaps of faith and maybe don't even practice leaps of faith on our own. That guy in the cartoon looks like he's past time to retire. <laughs> so it's a call to action. That's what this is all about. But we can't stop with the words. We have to get on to doing the things that we're supposed to do. And frankly, this is where Jesus' teaching differs from other moral teachings. If you go back to reading the Greek philosopher, Socrates in particular, what he would have called sin was ignorance. And ignorance is a bad thing. It leads to all kinds of bad things. 
And I, uh, I shared with you some things from uh, the Book of Joy, which was uh, written, a uh, great book, read it, get it, listen to it. Uh, it's the, His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Bishop Desmond Tutu. But in the book, uh, the Dalai Lama was asked, what is the hope for humankind? This is what he said. I think the only way really is through education. Education is universal. We must teach people, especially our youth, the source of happiness and satisfaction. We must teach them that the ultimate source of happiness is within themselves, not machine, not technology, not money, not power. Our book is part of this important process to help spread the message that love, kindness, and affection are the source of joy and happiness. Well, I agree with that, and I agree with Socrates. Ignorance leads in the wrong way. But the Sermon on the Mount goes to a deeper level. It goes to the reality that we people are evil. It says it in ch chapter 7, verse 11. If you then, who are evil, and we are fond of the easy path, it says it in chapter 7, verse 13. The road is easy that leads to destruction. And we are anxious people. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. And we are beset by temptations. That's right in the Lord's Prayer. Do not bring us to the time of trial. Friends, there's a deep flaw in our core humanness. It goes back to the very first class where we talked about the story of Cain, where he cries out to God, my sin is greater than I can bear. And so the Sermon on the Mount is acknowledging this deep flaw in us and calling us to not build on a foundation that will fail to build only on a foundation that is secure in life and in eternity. And that is the foundation of Jesus Christ. Everyone's going to build a house, which is synonym or symbol for building a life. The houses can be grand or simple, but no house can stand to life storms or the storm of the end times without the right foundation. So Jesus wants us to hear the message and put it into practice to found our lives, building of our lives on that which is eternal, that comes um, from him. So that's what this building a house on the foundation of rock or sand uh, is all about. Any thoughts, questions? I disagree. I don't think we're evil. I think when we act on the things that are within all of us that create evil, then the actions are evil. And we all have the ability to do that. I think the core source of who we are is not evil, though. That's just my own personal belief. Because I think about how we're created and the love of God within us. And we have all of those things that would allow us to act evil. But it's in the action. That, that the evil occurs, not in our very core as, that's just the way I look at it. Well, and in a way I agree with that, uh, and I think the scriptures can affirm that too, but the scriptures wrestle with this, uh, where, where does this come from, this mm -hmm. ability to do evil, if we're created good, we're created in God's image, yeah. so where does it come from? And you see it in places like the temptation in the garden, you see it in the story of Cain. You see it elsewhere. So there's a, the scriptures themselves wrestle with this very deep thing. Where does it come from? So, but I, so I understand what you're saying, and I agree with that. I could say that myself. I think there's another. But part. doesn't it come out of our free will? Because our free will isn't God. Our free will is as we live out our, our life as disciples, and that's where I think the evil occurs. Because then there's both our freedom of choice and our freedom of response to things. But okay. I mean, that's just. <laughs> sure. I, but if, well, I, I agree <laughs> and disagree at the same time. Very, very <laughs> That's a cop-off. Yeah. <laughs> what you're saying sounds a lot like the theory of original sin. Is that what you're, is that what you're saying without using those words? Right, that, that term gets batted around 
maybe get appropriate sometimes. But yeah, there's something about there's something about us that is not explained in my understanding, in my view, not explained simply by that sometimes we choose to do bad things. There's something about us that makes us at a very deep level contrary to to God. And it's not really explainable except in images, except in story. We can't make it all logical. Yeah. I go along with Nancy. I go <laughs> along with Mary Ann. As a child and growing up and end up in church, I used to really get upset with the prayer of confession where we would say that we were miserable offenders and there was no help in us. And I thought, we're not that bad. There's some help in us. There is. And I think that a good teacher today recognizes that you don't emphasize to a child how bad they are to get them to be better. You try to bring out the best in them and make them believe that they have goodness and they are good. And I think Jesus would be that way. But I think that as humankind, we do have our two natures. We have that human nature, but we have our spiritual nature. And the human nature is quite strong and we've been taught in scripture that that the devil is the governor of humankind and our humanness and of the earth. And so if we can follow Jesus, we'll get in touch with God, the better end of our nature <laughs> and behave better. And I think that's what Jesus would be telling us now. I well, <laughs> I, I agree that um, in terms of pedagogy, how we teach today, <coughs> It's unhelpful, whether children or adults, to say that you're the most miserable people that I've ever seen, and, uh, or to, you know, quote from Jonathan Edwards, "Sinners in the hands of angry God," uh, that we're just spiders being held above the flames of damnation by the the grace of God, and the fact that we're spiders is, you know, a pretty negative idea. But we probably will have to have a class about this. <laughs> challenge here really is we have to hear and then we have to act on what Jesus says. And there is a difference. And we see the difference. We have to be careful in not pointing out the difference to other people, but we, we need to, to trust what Jesus says and seek to follow him. Okay, we've got one more section to cover and we've got about ten minutes uh, to do it. So finally we come to Jesus' authority. After the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 28, chapter 7, Matthew says, Now when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their scribes. And then the first verse of chapter 8, When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. So he touched people's hearts and they followed him. So when Jesus says that we need to hear his words and act on them, he is claiming that he is speaking with authority. Unlike the other teachers of the day, the Jewish teachers of the day, the scribes, the Bible experts, they referred to God's law for their authority. The Old Testament prophets would say, thus says the Lord, but Jesus claims even more. And Matthew makes this point in chapter 16 where we have this famous encounter. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Matthew, in telling that, is making the point that with Jesus, we accept all his teachings, including those that demand submission to his lordship, or we reject them. For the early Christians, Jesus was not one way among many. He was the way and the one to whom we must listen. And Matthew says, the crowds were astounded. 
And that Greek word for astounded actually means fearful, even panicky, because they knew they were in the presence of someone unlike anyone they had ever heard before. It was exciting. It was also a little scary. And I think being a Christian can be a little scary sometimes. It's a challenge to be a Christian. And one commentator described all this, he says, the astonishment came because Jesus teaches without footnotes. <laughs> and I like that image. I don't teach without footnotes. If you saw my notes, I've got 22 footnotes in this one. <laughs> but Jesus teaches without footnotes. He teaches on his own authority. And he even dares to go beneath the surface of scripture to the heart of God's will. We've seen it in the sermon where he would say, you have heard it said, but I say to you. So are we going to listen and hear Jesus' words? And then most importantly, are we going to act on them? I have a couple things for closing, but uh, there's so much more in the Sermon on the Mount that we didn't cover, but any? Just general thoughts, reactions, well, chat. Sometimes a reference to the wide road or the easy way is to do nothing. And instead of standing and facing injustice in a, yeah. an active way or moving out of your comfort zone, uh, to be alongside people who maybe you're not always comfortable with, uh, that, that's action. And uh, an evil step is to maybe just do nothing and become complicit with, with injustice around you. That's right. There are all kinds of ways to take a, a false step or no step can be a false step. Not acting at all is, um, it's a kind of action, just it's by not doing something, it creates certain results. And that can be contrary to what God wants us to do. Any other thoughts? The sin of omission versus- The sin of omission. <laughs> There's sins of omission and sins of commission. And that prayer about being miserable sinners and no health in us leads to, you know, to a good outcome. Because the confession leads to the pronouncement of grace. And I like that prayer because it really gets your attention. I like, I'm like you, Liv. I'm, I'm not that bad. <laughs> but then I think, oh, maybe, maybe, Maybe I should look a little deeper and wrestle with this a bit. But it leads to uh, assurance of pardon. So, any other? Okay, I want to close by uh, praying two prayers. First, prayer together. And then I'd like to close with uh, another prayer that I found, I think, apropos. So, the prayer I'd like to pray is the Matthew version from the Sermon on the Mount of the Lord's Prayer. It's there on your handout. So let us pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us to say our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. And then I want to pray a prayer that was written by William Barclay. William Barclay was a great Scottish Bible scholar. Uh, he wrote a very popular commentary on the whole New Testament and the, on part of the Old Testament called the Daily Study Bible. He was asked that the Anglican bishops from around the world, they're called together every 10 years by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And for the 1948 conference of the bishops, Barclay was asked to write a prayer. And this was his prayer, and I think it's a very fitting way to end our class on the Sermon on the Mount. Almighty God, give us grace to not only be hearers, but doers of thy holy word. Not only to admire, but to obey thy doctrine not only to profess, but to practice thy religion, not only to love, but to live thy gospel. 
So grant that what we learn of thy glory we may receive into our hearts and show forth in our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. So friends, you don't have any more homework, <laughs> but the joyous challenge is still ahead of each one of us, and that is to be salty, luminous disciples. So blessings along the way. Thanks.